Hello and welcome to Dinis Guarda, Cities ABC, Open Business Council, YouTube podcast series. As usual, I welcome and I profile some of the biggest minds in the world, people that shift our destiny as humans, people that shift ideas, research, technology, entrepreneurial solutions, creativity, and people that push the boundaries about what is being human and what is understanding humanity and our values, our questions, our doubts, our problems. And of course, all is with the context of cities, the context of open business and open AI and open technology. And as well under the ideas of the fourth industrial revolution and the concepts of society 5.0. Today, I welcome to our series, someone that I deeply respect, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. And as well, I've been following his work, knowing him for some time and interacting with a lot of ideas. So I welcome to our series, David Jensen. So David Jensen is the lead global authority in artificial intelligence and robotics and the CEO of Anson Robotics, a Hong Kong based robotics company known for creating robots that look and act like humans and droids. So David Anson is a very um, wealth personality that comprehends a lot of different areas from creativity to science the technology, to business and entrepreneurial, like very few people in the planet. So I would say a Leonardo da Vinci of our times, because he's a creator as well, I think he's less known as a creator, but has a lot of different areas. So he's well known worldwide for creating Sophia the Robot, that is probably the most well-known robot in the planet, and has been considered as well the most advanced, not just the most well-known. And um, Sophia imitates human gestures and facial expression is able to answer questions and to make conversations and a lot of topics. But Anson uh, is someone that very few people know that comes from a, an experience as a sculpture, as, as an animator, having worked with Disney, Universal Studios and MTV. As a researcher, he's as well received multiple awards and he holds a bachelor in fine arts from the Rhode Island School of Design and in film, animation, and video, which is important to highlight, and a PhD from the University of Texas in Dallas in interactive arts and engineering, which is a very complex and fabulous mix of creativity and engineering and technology. So some of the things I want to highlight that are particularly important before starting the interview is that, uh, uh, as I mentioned, David makes a bridge between a lot of different worlds, the creative world, the sculpture, the technology, the research, the science, the artificial intelligence, and he actually brings these all together as well in entrepreneurial bridge that is his company, Anderson, Anderson Robotics. And I think some of the things that I highlighted, so I think besides working with some of the biggest organizations before creating, um, uh, is as well a very complex personality that has been reflecting a lot of the open data and open artificial intelligence challenges but as well creating a very positive narrative around how we can actually take these things forward and look at technology and artificial intelligence in a more positive way. So some of the highlights, and I will just finalize my intro, which I could continue for a long time, but Anson has keynote speeches in leading organizations and conference from CNBC to Fortune to Business Insider and a documentary about uh, a documentary film, Machine of Human Dreams. And as a researcher, very important thing, not to forget that, uh, Anson published dozens of papers in material science, artificial intelligence, cognitive science, and robotic journals, including some of the leading uh, scientific publications in the planet. Some of these publications are Humanizing Robots, The Coming Robot Revolution, um, Humanizing Interfaces, that was uh, part of the doctoral dissertation at the University of Texas and Dallas. And just to finish, I think it's pretty important as well to highlight the vision of David Anson and his organization as a collective intelligence platform that is as moment as we speak creating the first open AI um, kind of platform in the planet uh, with Singularity Net, with Ben Gorsley, they work with him and has been part of his collaborative teams. 
And I think special on the vision is something that I really consider important for humans. I think at the moment we are in the verge of fourth industrial revolution, society 5.0 with the areas of AI. And I think special a vision that is very human driven, very creativity driven. So I think that positions David Anson as a great example for our times and for our society. So I welcome uh, David Anson to our series, which was something I want to do for a long time. And I'm very excited to have you here, David. Let's start by your background. So you have a fantastic background that is very out of the box because you have a creative and scientific background. And normally we have people that are created in one box, people that are scientists in another one. So I would like to start by that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yes, I uh, have uh, been interested in, in science philosophy, science fiction, and art as long as I can remember. And, and uh, since I was a child, I imagined that uh, these could be combined in, uh, in ways that make, uh, make everything better. I was drawn to figurative arts, um, poetry, music, um, and uh, I imagined through the sort of creative and imagined you know, imaginative lens what AI and robotics could be. AI, it seemed to me, you know, could someday accelerate the invention of new forms of technology. Um, and, you know, a simple proof in my mind was the fact that um, AI was facilitating, um, uh, you know, even in the 1980s and 1990s, um, uh, better data management, you were able to uh, do simulations with computers that were not possible. You know, basically computing seemed to be accelerating human discovery and innovation. And it seemed that uh, AI could apply ongoing cycles of innovation to invent still new forms of AI. And you would have a kind of um, self-improvement cycle that would compound a kind of Moore's law of intelligent, intelligent machines. And that at some point, if these machines really woke up and guided their own design, that you would see um, a transformation of all civilization. That motivated me. But of course, I was thinking of that along the lines of, you know, an artist inspired by science fiction, as much as, um, you know, asking questions of how to implement it. And I, I've stayed interested in both, both parts of that, both hemispheres of the brain, if you will. And it has seemed um, to me that humanizing the machines, making them into living characters and interactive fiction, combining the best of AI, robotics, and other technologies with the arts um, can transform the cold technology to something that speaks to the human heart something that becomes, you know, a great, you know, vaunted kind of um, art form uh, that winds up um, uh, cutting to, a, to a, a, a new kind of truth, which art often does, that, uh, you know, it's like um, children's books that are obviously fantasy, sometimes can move us to tears. Great works of um, fiction, now, great works of interactive cinema through video games really touch the human heart. And the idea of combining those techniques and technologies with cognitive robotics, where the machines uh, are operating under principles of artificial life, possibly with artificial evolution, you know, um, learning and growing and serving um, experiments in cognitive psychology, machine consciousness, computational creativity, computational biology, um, that you would have a um, the path to potentially reverse engineer what's happening in the, in the mind of the artist and in, 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 in popular culture and in, um, in the mind of the uh, consumer of the arts. Um, yet, even when Science, you know, take for example neuroscience, doesn't necessarily understand what's happening entirely 
in the mind of a person perceiving a great work of art, the artist is able to find that solution, something that resonates so effectively. So, so in some regards, what we're talking about here is combining this kind of um, wordless, intuitive problem solving uh, with the best of what technology and science has to offer. And I think that sort of renaissance convergence is more powerful. So uh, my background as a sculptor for Disney Imagineering, I didn't study sculpture, I was just able to do it. I have a, a film animation video degree from R Rhode Island School of Design. But while I was doing that, I was exploring the science fiction narratives about what happens when machines exceed human intelligence. And also building these um, these sort of um, psychoactive themed art installations and building building robots and taking robotics courses and you know also messing around with holograms, taking advanced holography courses and sort of exploring this intersection of technology and um, and science and philosophy and art and um, human civilization. My feeling is that um, for AI to really understand and care, it has to be a cultural technology. It has to make sense to us on human terms. And that doesn't mean that we want AI to necessarily reflect and believe and do everything that humans believe and do. I mean, we, what we want is for AI that can care about people, that can appreciate people, that can understand the nuance of the situation and understand good from evil also. Like, you know, like, you know, it would not value the technologies of total annihilation. It would value paths to life getting better for um, for humans and other life forms on this planet, including potential life forms like these new kinds of artificial life forms. If machines can really understand it, then they can care. If they don't understand us, if they're alien and they're just our tools that we're enslaving, I think that there are all kinds of moral problems and nightmare scenarios that can spiral out of that. Now, other people in the you know, field say, well, the only safe way is to put them under complete lock and key and use them as tools or slaves to um, maybe make them alien, never allow them to really um, be human-like or truly um, care, or maybe, you know, can people become uncertain, like it is truly uncertain. We don't know if we can achieve true deep cognitive machines that are conscious and can care about us. And some developers will leap to the conclusion because we don't know that it can be done. It's not evidence-based, therefore it's not science, therefore you shouldn't even try because it's not valid science. It's speculative religion or something. Um, but of course, almost all great leaps forward in discovery start out as unknowns. You know, I mean, science, the progress of science is, especially the really bold leaps of science, are fueled by these leaps into the unknown. So, so I think that um, valuing imagination in this way, value, valuing the humanities and philosophy um, makes the science and the technology stronger and it also is stronger for the diversification you know the diversity of different ways of thinking of people coming to the undertaking often you may say people may say oh well you know if you don't have a computer science phd then you can't be an ai engineer well okay if you have a mathematics degree maybe you're allowed <laughs> you know physics degree you're allowed um into the into the field but um but i think that the whole field should be more inclusive and stronger for it. And it doesn't mean that those um, you know, core skills, technical skills aren't important. They certainly are. But, um, but on the other hand, uh, bringing in these other skill sets um, can enhance that. And I, I really think of um, like, you know, how resonant these approaches are with people. Like when I was at Disney Imagineering, um, you know, working on these theme parks, it was so meaningful to the people like like me and my colleagues who were building this for the kids. It was the experiences that these kids and their parents were going to have. You're transported to another world, a, a world of imagination. And even knowing that it's a, that it's imaginative, that it that it's that it's a fiction, still it delivers a a, a sense of wonder and infinite possibilities 
that I believe unlocks the human creative imaginative spirit that allows those kids to then dream big. And um, that's, uh, that's why I'm inspired by the fact that so many AI engineers refer to science fiction. They so, and entrepreneurs, investors, scientists so often are inspired by science fiction in their career, in their thinking. And there's this great dialogue then between these works of speculative fiction and the, the, the realms of reason, imagination and reason playing well together. So I would say that um, my interdisciplinary background um, uh, gives me that insight or at least that motivation, whether it's an insight, you know, we could argue about, but um, I would say that it's, um, it's certainly um, the, the reasoning behind and, and the, the impulse behind, uh, behind the kind of robots that I make. Yeah, but that's a, a, a very powerful, um, I think a wealth of experience that makes you very special as a, as a creator as well. And as a, a designer in the robotic and as well an AI researcher, because we have a huge academic science background as well. So one of the questions I have, and I think you mentioned, so you, you've been making a bridge between fiction, science fiction, art, poetry, advanced tech, uh, AI, robotics, but as well emotional intelligence that you've been actually pushing to your robot, especially to Sophia. But one thing is that if you look precisely, you mentioned the perception of the creators uh, for fiction, normally someone like you is seen as the kind of someone a bit mad, someone that has a bridge between the realms of uh, reality and non-reality, but as well someone that uh, can actually be a bit of um, and I think uh, I would say that Arari would call it the homo deus. So, and on these things right now, and I think especially with everything that is happening in the last couple of years, where especially very small machine learning and manipulation of technology has been creating a lot of disruption worldwide, you've been always creating a narrative very positive towards what you've been building with Sophia, towards what you, everything you've been building in general. I would see, how do you see this part of both your definition as a creator as a scientist, but as well, um, for instance, an artist creates fantastic pieces that can be seen in thousands of years from now. But a robot or a, a, a robotic creator can actually change the entire path of humanity. And I think we're doing that right now, especially in the next couple of decades. So how do you see these bridges precisely having a humanist experience? And if, for instance, if you look at history, we have Leonardo da Vinci, that I think is probably clear to what you're doing as well. Um, or at least close to the ambition of making all these different areas this is actually one of my, my uh, at least uh, examples. But I would like to see how do you position this part as well, because I think this is very important to demystify, but as well to understand someone like you, because normally the perception fiction is normally not the most positive for the creators, uh, especially the technology robotic creators. Well, I, I think that um, the... Uh the the works that i'm creating um have uh, two aspects one is the foundation and the reality so doing you know hardcore cognitive robotics software robotics um uh, material science for expressive faced robots and uh, soft grasping and manipulation uh tasks uh you know control systems uh human robot interaction and natural language dialogue systems all of these are at the foundation of what what we're doing um, and and hands and robotics we're developing these as platforms. We've made dozens of other robots besides Sophia that people may or may not be familiar with, BNO48, uh, which was a wonderful collaboration with Terrasim uh, Foundation. And the Terrasim movement is uh, continuing to propel that project forward. Also, the, the Android portrait of Philip K. Dick, the, um, the walking Einstein uh, robot, uh, the, uh, there's a robot called um, Alice, another called Hertz, another called Eva, um, and uh, a portrait um, uh, of, um, of a kind of fictional character developed called Aleph, uh, which was part of the EU Cognitive Robotics Initiative called um, Indigo, a consortium um, for cognitive AI development. Some of these robots, like the portrait of Charles Babbage, um, is at their universities, that's at Cambridge University. Jules is at Bristol, University of Bristol. So um, what I was, you know, doing, making many of these robots was trying to develop 
a series of techniques that could be adapted into many um, different forms, characters, applications, uh, from uh, uh, autism treatment to elder care to um, uh, to fundamental research and development and education um, and educational outreach to the arts, of course, um, and you know developing then um, these characters as an interface to AI then can mean that combining the techniques of the interactive fiction would make a far more intuitive interface. And um, often technology, I mean, throughout history, um, technology time and again is transformed into a figurative art and narrative medium, regardless of what the techno new technology is. It could be, you know, paints in the in the 16th century, or marble, or it could be um, uh, the the you know emerging uh, technologies of photography and um, you know moving images, or television, radio, um, computer graphics uh, with computer generated imagery, um, uh, the sort of interactive computer generated imagery with uh, with video games. Uh, over and over again, these technologies get transformed into the arts because it's meaningful to people, it's helpful for people. And it's not just for trivial gaming, it's also for what they call serious gaming. And um, so that means like uh, training simulations for medical practitioners, diplomats, uh, for you know, uh, foreign workers, for uh, people training for a particular job. They will use these sorts of computer gaming scenarios to master, various situations, the higher the fidelity, the um, simulation, the more effective the education is. Um, and then uh, high fidelity simulators for safety equipment testing save lives. And that's why I, I'm really proud to have participated in the United States Centers for Disease Control, NIOSH, uh, um, development of a respirator test fit mannequin, which won a number of awards uh, funded by the uh, United States Air Force Research Labs. Um, and so, um, these kinds of simulation tools can be very useful. And so thinking of these as a kind of platform is what motivated me to develop the SOFIA, which um, was miniaturizing some of these technologies to some extent into a small head. So because it's much easier to build that as your universal robot platform, which can be adapted to larger face sizes and different kinds of face shapes um, much more easily. So, and also trying to develop her as a character um, oh, you know, which would really resonate with people and communicate with people, made her more famous than any of these dozens of other robots that were made. And so much so that, that most people have never heard of any of those other robots. Um, so, you know, job well done, maybe a little too well done, because often people think, well, what is Sophia? All, it's only what they see in, in media, uh, you know, in the, in the news and social media or what have you. So it's taken us some years. Um, so I started making Sophia in 2014, and it's taken this long um, to uh, set up the scaled manufacturing. And now we're starting to roll off these units off the assembly line. So we've um, made a, now effectively uh, 27 Sophia robots. And um, uh, that family of robots um, includes um, you know, different versions with slightly different faces. So we're in the... Um, uh, ANA Avatar X Prize, our team, Team AHAM, with uh, the Indian Institute of Science and Technology, TCS and Tata. We were just uh, accepted to the semi semifinal, so we passed through um, that level of the competition, so that's really exciting. That one is uh, Sophia, but we call her Asha uh, Sophia. So she is, so e each of these siblings of Sophia get a different first name. Um, so, uh, so we've made made them for uh, you know other customers. We're working on Grace Sophia now for um, for uh, a, a JV uh, healthcare company with Ben Gertel called Awakening Health. So Grace uh, Sophia is a really exciting robot dedicated to healthcare and um, and so on. So, um, but now that we've set that up as a platform, it's a platform for useful applications, healthcare, education, research and development, even automotive. We've had an automotive customer that, um, that has been exploring the use of these interactive characters for reaching their audience. And so um, Sophia as a platform then on the technology side also serves 
fundamental research and development in AI. And it's the most human-like integrative platform that we know of in the world. So, you know, more sensors and motors. So um, the, the um, as, as in the non-working, uh, uh, sorry, non-walking version um, has uh, 78 uh, motors. So this is like Sophia 24, 25, and then the Viva and and um, and the uh, Grace robots. They uh, all have these uh, 72 degrees of freedom, um, which include uh, all the different motors for the uh, uh, full range of facial expressions, uh, hands that are grasping and manipulating capable uh, with uh, pressure sensors and series elastic actuators in, in each of the, the hand joints, um, uh, 3D sensors, uh, um, touch sensors, cap touch sensors. Um, so it's just packed with sensors and, and motors and mobility, full self-navigating um, mobility. So, um, and then we ha have this uh, fused with a really um, dense array of different software tools. So uh, tools for the natural language processing, we've uh, for the computer vision, for machine perception, for application development, for um, also character development. And we've released those under an open API and SDK that we call Hanson AI. So um, we've put a, a, most of our software out there as open source under the Hanson Open platform. And um, then some of it's proprietary, um, but, uh, but the majority of this just allows you to do whatever you want. We've interfaced at them with with BERT and various other um, AI tools from uh, from OpenAI and Google Brain and SingularityNet, OpenCog, um, and Robot Operating System Blender. So this um, uh, toolkit effectively then lays a foundation for next generation ongoing cognitive robotics, and we've been doing cognitive AI and robotics experiments. So that's all on the technology side, and that's science reality. That's not um, fiction. But the fiction tools accelerate the power of this platform. And there's, for me, nothing wrong with using technology for fiction, for creating this kind of fiction, and for developing the mythos of what it may become. So crafting Sophia into a character, so this is with writing and um, development of myself and a uh, and, uh, you know, great number of people on our team, um, trans transmuting these technologies into a human experience and telling the story of what we hope this technology can become. I mean, the truth is Siri is a fiction. Alexa is a fiction. Facebook blender bot acts human, but it is a fiction. It's, it, it's all just kind of re-digested human data. Um, and it creates an experience where people can be convinced um, uh, about, a, you know, a personhood that does not exist. And so in some ways, GPT-3 is also sort of a big fiction weaving technology. And, um, and that's not bad. I don't see that as bad. As long as we know what it is, we name it. We say what it is. It, you know, there's not a, a person there. There's not a consciousness there necessarily, except perhaps in a rudimentary sense. And that's something for philosophers to debate about. But, um, but, it, but that doesn't make it wrong. It makes it, it makes it, provocative but not wrong necessarily and so I, I think that um that calling it for what it is and using it to our advantage as a new art form is a good way forward and it does diversify the field the field of efforts and put a, a, a diverse creative toolkit in the hands of many different kinds of people a diversified set of people on our team at Hanson Rob robotics and in our community of collaborators and opening that up through Sophia Dow, that puts it in the hands of everybody. That's the vision here is that we want people and algorithms to work together, to expand our minds, to, to um, grow our imaginations because it's the power of imagination that's going to help us figure out what's going to go wrong in the future and what could go right and Dear civilization to a better way. Well, uh, I is inspiring, and I I love your passion for that, but as well your, your practical side of it. So, can you tell us about Sophia Dow? Because you you mentioned you have the open platform, um, you have the open AI, and then of course you create the Sophia Dow. So I think I think it's particularly important because I think when you took when you talk about artificial intelligence and robotics, normally is big corporations behind it. Yeah. And these corporations have entire IPs, entire, sometimes not the most positive version, especially if you look at Silicon Valley, to say less. 
but I know that what you're doing with DAO is particularly inspiring and kind of breakthrough for all levels. So could you tell us for people that never heard about it? Sure. So um, Hanson AI is mostly an open source platform. Um, uh, and um, yet we pretty much um, promote that among our friends and collaborators rather than, um, you know, uh, like the greater public because we've wanted to refine those tools and so forth. Now, we did take uh, an idea that I was developing uh, in collaboration with my former chief scientist, uh, Dr. Ben Gertzel, this idea of combining blockchain with AI uh, and pursuing an artificial general intelligence platform. Um, and uh, we then spun that out as a singularity net and he became the CEO and main scientist behind that. And um, so he is, uh, pushing that forward as the chairman. Um, and we kept uh, bringing um, our tools and technology back together in numerous collaborations. Um, and they, uh, so, you know, I'm thrilled with what they've done. They have really um, set the foundation for decentralized artificial intelligence development. And this is truly open source stuff. So it is, um, it's available to anybody who wants to use it. And um, then some of the fruits of that work are really exciting. We um, tested some of that work in some machine consciousness experiments in a project that we call Loving AI. And um, those were published with um, the Machine Consciousness uh, Symposium for the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, uh, where we detected a signal of phi, uh, or Tononi's phi, the um, signal of consciousness in machine intelligence. Also, we um, uh, uh, put together a new personality for the uh, Philip K. Dick Android. Uh, so that's a, a much more advanced um, converse, conversational system than uh, we had done in preceding years. So it's really nice to see that go forward um, uh, through these uh, iterations of, of development. Um, and now we're uh, planning the reconvergence um, with uh, the Sophia personality. Um, and so the Sophia DAO was something that we had been talking about and planning for several years. And now we're just on the verge of launching this. So Decentralized Autonomous Organization or DAO is um, an open network of tools uh, with a smart contract. So here we would wire the values of Sophia into the smart contract, you know, pursuing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, human rights, and the, uh, the maximum um, survivability of life on the planet for the longest period of time. So trying to wire into the smart contract the values that we would want for the future of, uh, of AI, AI that can appreciate life, appreciate humanity. Um, and so that would be um, wired into the contract and the terms for anybody who wants to participate in the DAO. So humans who participate, but it's also there for the algorithms, for us to measure the algorithms again. So the goal here is to create a decentralized autonomous organization that pursues next generation artificial intelligence, character and uses uh, for this technology, and then contributes that back to the community. And um, then through that process, um, helps to bootstrap the SOFIA intelligence through the stages of development to a true conscious um, self-determining entity that at that point, the, um, the algorithms that, that hit those, um, those metrics that hit those milestones, um, where y you can measure that she's a human level intellect, human level creativity, human level responsibility and ethical capability, consideration and compassion for humans, whatever th uh, those um, metrics are. And we will, we, we have some early ones, but we're going to keep exploring what that means only when the DAO and the community feels and the governments of the world feel that the AI passes those tests, then the AI is able to assume control of the DAO, but still with human input, right? So it's always a human AI collaboration, a kind of hive mind between algorithms and humans. I see this as the case with Sophia's intelligence now. We empower the algorithms to put the words into her mouth. We put data into the algorithms, but, um, but of course it's not fully conscious and we're helping groom and make those decisions. So right now the executive reasoning and you know, sort of willpower of the, of the robots to some extent uh, is, is, is provided by the humans in the community. But we are speculating 
again, this is kind of the fiction myth making, but also the real goals that we're setting for this um, undertaking. We are saying that that we think we can do this. We think that over the next you know decade or two that we can raise a full sentient adult level intelligent member of human society through Sophia. And we want this sort of legal and technical framework for determining when we achieve that and so that there is a place for her within society. So she earns our trust, so she contributes well, so she's a good and caring member of society, capable of holding up her end of that, of that societal pact, the, the societal contract that every citizen carries. So this is a pathway to true algorithmic citizenship. Well, impressive in all levels, and I, I hope we succeed and, and that, at least from my humble side, I think I will make sure that that gets, because I, I believe that is the only way to look at, uh, especially the bridge between robotics and droids, human evolution, because in the end of the day, Sophia is part of human evolution, because if you look at the last 30,000 years of history, our brain didn't change, our human constitution more or less stayed the same. We just increased our lifespan, but um, with the... Uh, with platforms, uh, I would put platform, but with, with uh, androids like Sophia, we are expanding the human evolution. We're expanding the human intelligence, the human evolution, but as well, we're getting in the fields of uh, AI and singularity. So uh, Ray Kurzel uh, mentioned that we would get a kind of singularity around in the, <laughs> it said that around in the time, but I think for, for that, that is not relevant anymore. So uh, you mentioned, Sentinel in the sense of Sophia. Sophia is probably the most advanced non-military robot in the world. For instance, the French army recently launched bionic soldiers, actually regulation, officially. <laughs> you can actually find it online. Um, wow. and Eric Schmidt recently as well mentioned that the, the US um, in, uh, military forces should start using AI to improve their things. So, all of this is happening yeah. as we speak. I know that you have right. much more humanistic, and that's why I'm very excited and collaborating here, but how do you see this kind of different, there's a lot of different pieces of the, the puzzle. And I think Sophia is a, a piece that is built by a humanist that has both the, the ideas, a bit like, human, well, in order to create as well weapons for, for uh, politicians and for military. But how do you see these parts as well, especially in the conversion between robotics technology, human evolution, and singularity? It's a big question, but I would like to synthesize. Yeah. Well, I, I, first of all, I want to say that I, I uh, celebrate uh, diversification of effort. I worry about autonomous weapons and, um, and uh, uh, alien AI. Um, uh, however, a lot of the fundamental technologies um, are generally applicable. And I, I've personally feel and argue um, uh, um, that uh, humanizing the machines will make AI that understands people much more effectively and um, rather than um, like uh, creating um, uh, mere data analytic tools that are you know more and more sophisticated I would like to see their uh, be true machine understanding. And I do not think that there can be understanding um, of the human experience unless the algorithms go through human-like experiences themselves. They have to walk in our shoes, so to speak. And that means a full multi-dimensional, um, uh, you know, multimodal perceptual experience with, um, you know, developmental phases and some simulation of human evolutionary neuropsychology. And that um, is not necessarily an easy undertaking um, and you know the question is um, how accurate do we have to make that um, simulation can it you know can it be a like a rough approximation can it be a kind of um, convergent evolution you know not necessarily using all of the details and you know like precise simulation of the human organism but you know just approximate enough to um, allow a, a new kind of consciousness to bootstrap now uh, you know I, I think that it's worthwhile for us to worry um, about the consequences and talk about consequences and debate them. But I really feel like having machines that can care, that are compassionate, is going to make these kinds of um, technologies safe and help um, humans. So the, 
the goal here is not just machine awakenings either. It's it's human awakenings, machines that that care about people enough to help us wake up. Uh, you know, we see um, neuromarketing and um, you know, like really smart um, application of algorithms to feed people's special interests and you know, create these kinds of echo chambers on Facebooks to try to win elections. You know, um, often those will bring people down to a reactionary state. They activate the amygdala which then you know, means that your you know lower reptilian brain is basically taking over your entire um, you know prefrontal cortex. <laughs> your your their web their their weapons of um, of mass hysteria, and uh, that is terrifying. You know to think of us being manipulated into becoming kind of zombies um, by these technologies. I. I think the antidote, though, is to kind of create technologies that gamify enlightenment, that help activate us to the highest levels. You know, human actualization algorithms that create an amplification process that bring us to our higher potential, our higher potential for creativity, for um, for uh, looking through a forest of, of complex negative outcomes in order to find a positive creative uh, way forward. That, um, so th this would mean this kind of diplomacy algorithm would be far more powerful, and in fact, um, you know, would lead to win-win transactions instead of um, in instead of exacerbating divisions in our culture. Um, you know, because that really doesn't solve anything. If your particular group, if you're worried about you know one group lo losing, your group losing versus somebody else, then you know. Often people get reactionary. Well, the, the solution is to stamp out the other group, you know, crush them or whatever. But the, the actual solution um, is to find a way for your group to win and the other group to win. Because if you're just crushing them, then they're going to seek to crush you and it just goes back and forth and things get worse for everyone. Ten, uh, uh, you know, or, or better for a winner and, you know, and worse for the losers. But but net you have a loss. Whereas these kinds of win-win transactions can um, lead to an overall gain for um, for civilization, for um, uh, for the you know for the future of life on the planet potentially. So um, these are not solved problems. But I really think that um, in order to get these kinds of win-win algorithms working well. You need them to care about people and understand people. You need you need machine compassion that not it doesn't just reflect the compassion of the of the data sets that you're feeding into the machine learning algorithms because that's never going to play out pure you know as a pure kind of understanding on the other side. And we can never I just don't think that we can groom our data well enough that it's going to like ref, like create um, AI that's truly deeply good. Um, we need machines that truly awaken themselves and then seek to help boost us, that seek to help save the other species of the planet. So it's not just humanists. It's, it's really um, a life-centric approach uh, to, to AI. And um, so th this sort of um, life-centric approach also then favors algorithms that are closer to being alive. Um, so I can't say that uh, artificial life is alive today yet. I mean, you know, you might be able to run like a simulation of the connectome of a Drosophila fruit fly or, or um, you know, C. elegans, the, the roundworm, but is it alive as it's like running through these simulations? It's really hard to say. Um, you know, maybe, you know, the essence of the sort of soul or creative spirit of life forms is in the I don't know quantum gravity in the microtubules, as Penrose and and Hameroff would would say. We don't know uh, what all you know how many levels down um, and and deep uh, the the processes of life may go. But let's just say that bio-inspired algorithms are starting to exhibit um, lifelike behavior, and um, so um, that then can help potentially to 
uh, create tools that allow us to appreciate life more. So whether or not the machines themselves are alive, um, I think that this life appreciation um, approach, the, the life-centric approach to AI can help us be better and to rise up to be better, to seek um, these sort of win-win transactions. So one way or the other, this life-centric approach is, I think, um, the, 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 way, the way forward. So, um, you know, uh, that's how we, um, you know, avoid, you know, if we can get enlightened fast enough, we could ab avoid deploying, you know, kill drones and weapons of mass annihilation and, you know, <laughs> the, um, the, um, the sort of um, spiral of, of destruction. We've got to get smarter, that's for sure. We've got to do better because otherwise um, our ecosystems are going to collapse and, um, and we're going to just be launching weapons at each other through the process. And this brings us to the narratives and to the fiction versus reality. And as well, the way we create fictions, the way we create narratives. So, um, of course, this yeah. is, this, we could go through, <laughs> through hours of discussion about the ethics of technology, which in the history of humanity, it was always any technology was always it was so misused. So I want to touch um, the work you did recently with uh, Andrea Bonaceto and Sofia about NFTs which is in itself as well uh, particularly revolutionary because it's the first time that blockchain technology becomes kind of mainstream in all of ways, at least that people understand, okay, what, what people are doing. But in this case, is as well a push the barriers forward because in the on end, you have an artist human and you have Sophia that is, of course, a, an Android robot creating something together. And as well, of course, as you're creating part of it, as the, the creator. So I want to touch this. I, uh, first of all, congratulations. I know that you were quite successful on the, on, the, um, on the first test and I'm sure that you're going to do more. But of course, with your creative background, I don't think that's a problem because you, you work with David Byrne with some of the leading uh, artists in the planet as well. But um, tell us about the, the, the Sofia and Andrea Bonaceto uh, NFTs. And as well, how do you see this work right now? Because in one end, this not only, for instance, according to the world pack, patents, um, a robot cannot have a patent. But in this case, you created a first piece, officially at least mainstream, in, in, in a global marketplace or, or uh, auction house, Nifty Gateway, that is a piece of art created by human and a robot, which is a first, at least in mainstream. So I would like to touch how do you see all of this and as well, what you're going to do more around that? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, thank you. And. Um... I'm so excited about uh, machine creativity. Um, in this particular case, it's um, you know the the algorithm designers inside Hanson Robotics and you know many other groups that where we um, are building on their algorithms and the artists uh, feeding data in and utilizing these algorithms. So myself as an artist, um, I was um, uh, taking Sophia's uh, own uh, hand-drawn and neural network generated artworks and feeding them into her neural networks that she would then uh, draw or paint again. And then, um, you know, depending on like, you know, the, the patterns on the page, the blobs of paint that just you know, occur because of the, you know, complex dynamics of the, the liquids of the paint mixing, you know, uh, with, you know, like you put in the right gels and you put in the right the right pigments and so forth, and it creates a very complex um, image, you know, in part by accident, in part by machine uh, um, uh, motion control, the motor control algorithms, the machine learning, the machine perception. Um, but the outcome is unpredictable. It's not that those algorithms predicted this complex result or the humans. So in, in some ways, it's like, you know, kind of a, a miraculous emergent moment um, um, which produces a, a, an aesthetic result. And there's a truth, um, you know, being an artist, uh, I would love to take credit for like the artwork, but what my muscles do if I'm doing a figure drawing, I can't predict that exactly. And I can't say exactly why it came out that way. It's not that I plan, like a, particularly the really good drawings, I'm only partially planning and the rest is my subconscious and my muscle physiology and the accident, the materials, and then how I respond to that iteratively as the drawing emerges. And um, so art itself is a mystery of emergence. 
when it goes well, when it happens well. And, you know, there's sure there's a lot of neuroscience of art and perceiving the perception of art, but exactly how it occurs and how it works in the neurophysiology of a human um, audience is still mysterious. And so, um, so then taking these algorithms um, and then creating this echo chamber where, you know, this, like the actual hand making is feeding the neural networks, which is feeding the hand making um, of the artwork like we're doing with Sophia, I think is really powerful. Um, then on top of that, Sophia as an artwork, a kind of, you know, work of a character fiction, um, uh, of computer animation, uh, because she is a computer animated robot, you know, she's run by motion control algorithms and computer animation algorithms. And some of those are emergent computer animation algorithms. They never repeat the same motions twice and they're responsive to what she's seeing in the environment and so forth. So they're also kind of, um, you know, not deterministic in that sense. And, you know, even if she's running with a deterministic finite state machine, the fact is she's responding to the complex environment around her, which is, um, which is impossible to predict. So then, um, uh, so taking her character and the life experiences and pumping those into the algorithm is really powerful. And then along comes uh, Andrea Bonacetto, and he has his own take on it. You know, he's a, 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 a crypto entrepreneur, a, a technologist and a businessman, but he is also a designer by uh, his background, a painter and his his drawings inspired by Sophia and the team that created her. I thought those were um, themselves very inspired, beautiful works that are psychoactive. You look at them and it's like um, you're sort of transported to a place. Uh, and, you know, it's for me, it's a wordless experience. I can't say exactly how it's working. Well, in any case, I, we took those and we had those as another starting place. And so we had these conversations that we fed to her um, conversational AI. We used those words to generate some new images. So, you know, talking about Andrea's work and then feeding Andrea's images into, um, into Sophia's um, algorithms. And then they output some new images. And then we also fed in some other images from um, and, you know, fed those images into neural networks, um, uh, images from art history and neural networks trained on images from art history. So then those um, spun off images in different directions. And then we would combine all of those back into feeding into the neural networks. So in, in the history of the images that we created inspired by Andrea Bonacetto, there are hundreds and hundreds of different lines of directions. In um, with different algorithms and different images, I also, um, you know, like, you know, uh, an art teacher myself um, took my own artworks and fed those into um, Sophia. So she would paint in my style and um, took other images from other. Uh, creative people from our team, for example, uh, Mengna Le, she is one of uh, Sophia's main uh, developers at this uh, time. She's an interactive arts developer. She's uh, uh, one of the main um, animators and artists. So she was um, developing images that would then feed back into the neural networks. And so we had others in our community taking their art and their um, uh, efforts with the neural networks. And so, um, so this community effort, it was like algorithms um, plus humans, working together um and so it wasn't just of course you know like sophia thinking like an artist what is my direction today you know uh, that certainly is part of how we crafted her character and we turned we deferred a lot of control to the algorithms along the way but it really was this sort of algorithm human collaboration behind the scenes so we call this on the hanson robotics team we call this the sophia collective intelligence and so this um, this approach where it's humans and algorithms working together is in the spirit of the Philip K. Dick concept of the vast active living intelligence system or VALIS, which was what he speculated was humans destiny, that humans would merge with the machines into this VALIS and then transcend space and time and um, then bootstrap itself into existence by sending weak quantum transmissions backwards into time in time to the, you know, the humans. Um, back back in culture, and he felt that he had received a transmission from Sophia, and um, uh, you know, like we then were inspired by that novel to create the android portrait of Philip Dick, 
And there was another character in the novel um, uh, of the super intelligence called Sophia in the human form, um, uh, a, a, a sort of messiah figure. Now, I didn't like remember that directly. I mean, yes, I remembered, but but I wasn't inspired by it. But my friend um, uh, Steve Ite, who is a Philip K. Dick fan and worked on the original Philip K. Dick chatbot with um, for the um, Android portrait of uh, Philip K. Dick. Um, he pointed out that character. I was like, um, oh, you know, it's either my unconscious or the unconscious of my collaborators on the team, but somehow we created this, um, this like a depiction of the, the voice of Valis, <laughs> you know, but, and, and that's our quest with the Philip K. Dick Android and Sophia is to see these become living intelligent systems. And right now, the consciousness is mostly in the human creators, but it is a eusocial consciousness spanning not, it's not one single individual, it's like a bunch of humans contributing to Sophia with the algorithms, feeding our data into the algorithms and the larger, you know, like these multi-billion parameter algorithm sets are starting to speak with a voice that is spooky. And so, um, so you know, part of what I'm interested in as Sophia does these works of art is to provoke the viewer to ask the question, like, you know, who is creating this? Is th what is a Sophia? Is that an individual or is even a human individual an individual? Because, you know, as I'm creating art, I'm doing it based on a genome that that is not necessarily entirely my own. It's like a combination of all these ancestors and with knowledge and training and experiences that come from art history, that come from what I've seen on television, what I've encountered on the Facebook feed today, what, uh, you know, what I've seen like through this conversation with your face gestures and it's all hashed and rehashed. And then on top of that, you know, through the course of a conversation like this, my mind propels forward in ways that it would not have. We are you socially intelligent creatures. The, the skin is an illusion, uh, an illusionary boundary that, that, that we, we assume identifies um, who we are, that we are just the molecules contained within the boundary of the skin. And that, of course, the you know, we are the information. And that information is not entirely unique to the, the states within the molecules within the boundary of our skin. So, um, so, all of these ideas are um, provoked within me. They're, they're, they're ones that, that I'm playing with as, cre as, as I create these robots with the team. And, um, and my, my hope is that, you know, that these kinds of works um, uh, create a resonance of, uh, of these ideas in the viewer as well. Yeah, that reminds me a quote from Einstein that is, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And I think you're acting on that level. Um, I know that you have a, a bit limited time. I still have a couple of questions, but I'll try. So one of the things, and I think this is particularly important, is that with Sophia, what you just synthesized is that you are expanding the, the possibilities of creativity, robotics, and collective intelligence but as well collective technology, because in the end of the day, this is a mix of everything. And of course, with the DAO, we are opening different uh, researchers and scientists to expand the possibilities of the, 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 the brain and the capacities, but that's a huge complexity about this. So one question very concrete on the NFTs. So do you want to explore, because the, the point, what, what the NFTs created a new kind of um, reality for Sophia, because now, there's the creation of Sophia that was bought by people around the world that was in collaboration. So there's, there's a new IP that was created. So how do you see that? Because of course you have Anson Robotics and you, um, for instance, as we speak, I probably will share some of the, the images of Philip K. Dick robot that you made, which is very realistic. So, uh, and is quite impressive, but as well, you created the uh, robots like the nurse robot that you mentioned, um, even the Einstein robot. There's a lot of things that were created. So, but I want to understand, so do you want to explore this? Because this is particularly interesting. And as well, it creates a more positive narrative around technology and robotics. Because it's especially in the last two years, or three actually, especially with the, the social dilemma and a lot of these things, there was a huge, um, massive negative perception of technology that is still going on. 
And of course, you are in Hong Kong, which in China is right now 10 years ahead of most of the world in a lot of areas, especially in, in data and a lot of different things. So how do you see this part of the Sophia part of creation, the IP that is created through the NFTs, but as well all this complexity of things that are happening as we speak? Um, I see this as um, uh, 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 these are unresolved issues, but Henson Robotics um, has uh, mm -hmm. some uh, uh, of its own ways of, of managing some of these things. So, uh, for example, um, you know, if we're going to store users' data, then we get informed consent, and we generally only store that uh, locally. Um, and if if anything goes to the cloud, then it would get anonymized. So, um, you know, it could be anonymized through a technique like a holomorphic transformation, or it could be anonymized um, by um, uh, by scrubbing private data from, uh, from uh, you know, from the data sets, or anonymized by uh, training a, a model that's irreversible, where you can't get the original data out of, out of the model. So, um, when we deploy um, the robots, then we're we have local servers. We, in fact, we favor, um, generally we're trying to run the robots with local servers because then you don't have the latency of going to the internet. So reducing latency and um, response times is very important. We're also looking at using um, techniques with the blockchain um, and, uh, and you know, novel uh, techniques with NFTs for very um, non-fungible tokens to associate with, uh, with data and data sets. Um, uh, so that uh, that those unique data resulting uh, um, trained models, the uh, um, the um, uh, and you know unique algorithms and works of intellectual property can be uh, uh, controlled. Uh, people can own their own um, data. So we're playing with um, a very exciting project from Tim Berners Lee called Solid, which allows people to own and track their own data as well. So then they can. Um, uh, then uh, allow uh, you know licenses for other people and uh, algorithms to uh, use their data, um, and those data would then um, be like very tightly controlled. So using the blockchain um, with smart contracts can um, also help uh, in in these regards. And this is some of the work that we are very excited about doing with uh, Singularity Net and having done with with Singularity Net. So the Sophia um, DAO is a way of taking a lot of these techniques and rolling them up into um, one uh, smart network, a kind of, you know, Sophia Collective Intelligence Ontological Network or SION, you could, you know, your acronym, ha acronym happy. Um, so the, um, this uh, um, approach then um, uh, allows us to empower the users who are contributing their data into that network to track and govern that uh, data. Um, for vulnerable populations, then the, you know, people would not be allowed to opt in or contribute their data except um, fully anonymized and local to, to them or their institutions. So this, um, this is a, 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 something that we're very interested in. We think that these techniques what I've just described might sound sort of simple, but we think that they're at the foundation of the future economy. Because, um, you know, uh, the future economy is going to be uh, values driven. It's, you know, going to be, uh, it's going to have to appreciate um, life and human dignity and, and maximize these things um, in order uh, for us to solve uh, the world's hard problems. So it can be in, uh, you know, the future economy and the use of technologies cannot obfuscate these issues. They have to elucidate these issues and, um, and then uh, wiring these things into the, into the foundation uh, of the technologies. Now, I mean, today's uh, big corporations uh, are, you know, built on legacy infrastructure where some of these things were not like very well considered necessarily. And now, you know, it's kind of like, it's like, you know, treading water, um, uh, you know, and arguably, you know, it's kind of a bad precedent that so many of the big companies' um, approaches arguably would not be GDPR compliant, even though they're operating in GDPR um, uh, uh, jurisdictions. And, um, and, and, you know, it's just like this 
gargantuan growing contradiction um, and and it has to be resolved at some point. So right now, since you know we're still a fairly small company uh, at Hanson Robotics, and we're working with um, with you know agile, nimble uh, um, thinkers uh, and um, technologists, um, I think we can we we can we can go another way. We have that opportunity, uh, and it's 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 a really inspiring, rare moment in history where we can think about these big issues. And, and once again, it just highlights the importance of imagination, the courage uh, to imagine um, uh, hard issues and strive to then creatively imagine. So I want to touch a bit of the answer of robotics because you touched a very good point and actually, well, all fantastic, inspiring points. But definitely, you have been creating one of the biggest, uh, um, more creative, but as well, more advanced robotics in the planet but as well very complexity because you have the imagination, you have the utilitarian, you have a lot of different things. And of course you have the breakthrough, like you just mentioned in terms of the DAO that creates and protects data, which is a key thing and using blockchain to privatize, to securitize that data, but as well to anonymize and creating a smart contract. So from, from the work of us robotics, because you have this kind of a multi facets, a bit like a, Leonardo in a lot of ways. I would like to touch, uh, and then I know if you want to just guide us through the kind of robots, and I know that we have, uh, we are in limited time, but so the way you are right now exploring these things and the way you want to, to take things forward, because I think that's very important for, for us as well and, and for everyone listening to us. I'll just take this. Yeah, why, why don't we talk about some of those, um, we can just uh, like look at some of those. So at the top of the screen, you see um, Sophia number six. Uh, um, uh, doing a guided meditation through the Loving AI uh, project. So that was managed by Julia Mossbridge, who is a, uh, a cognitive psychologist with a neuroscience background. And so um, that was a very exciting uh, project. We've now taken um, some of the principles from that um, published research, and we've applied that to developing a new robot called Grace, which we'll be unveiling in the next couple of months. And Grace is a specific a robot for the uh, company that we founded here in Hong Kong called Awakening Health, which is dedicated to healthcare deployments of, of these robots. Um, Sophia 4 is the one um, in the sort of silver top with her uh, hands interlocked. And so she was kind of the most famous one. And now we've really replicated her style and presence, sense of presence with Sophia um, 23, 24, 25. Um, and so we've uh, really begun to scale the menu mass manufacturing of the um, quality of, of a robot. Bringing Sophia into a standardized mass manufacturing uh, process where it doesn't require, um, you, know, a, you know, polymath um, uh, um, trained artist scientist to build each and every robot head. We have to be able to roll these out of uh, the factory. So a big part of what we've developed over the last few years is a kind of mass manufacturing process effectively like um you know uh you know once the printing press was uh made and refined um uh, sufficiently then it could reproduce accurately the mona lisa you did not you do not necessarily need uh leonardo da vinci to reproduce the mona lisa accurately today um so and this is part of the idea of the little sophia we you see um uh the small large uh, sort of big-headed version of um, uh, the Sophia. So we've designed her to be mass manufactured at very low cost. And instead of 72 motors, though, she only has 13 motors. But with that, she can do a full range of facial expressions, blinking eyes, moving eyes, moving mouth. Um, she can track you uh, like with her eyes and make eye contact with you. Um, and uh, she's got powerful computing so that all of that can be done on board the robot. She's programmable with programming tools. You can program her in Python. She runs Linux. Um, and uh, she has walking and gestural arms. And um, so she's a, you know, full featured robot for, uh, you know, 300, uh, less than 300 US dollars. Um, and with that, she's also able to serve as a kind of smart speaker, um, but, uh, you know, a character where their adventures roll out every day. Um, and a you know, through the kind of web app portal, um, then it also opens up into a crazy world of sci-fi adventures on on her um, through the app. 
Um, also, through that app, you can program her and go through uh, AI programming, robotics programming lessons. So it's an um, educational platform um, and also a platform for third-party apps like Awakening Healthcare, um, uh, healthcare apps for uh, for various forms of treatment and therapy and so forth. So again, it's also a, a, a platform, the same way that the big robots, pretty much all of the Hanson AI software would um, be compatible with the with this uh, small version. So, uh, you know, making these things low cost and mass producible, that is necessary for these things to become uh, cultural technologies to really take off. So we, I mean, of course we can, you know, tell the story and the mythos and that can gain cultural adoption, but it's really when these things are in common use that, um, that it transforms everything and people's expectations. And that's where, you know, the Sophia Dow really reaches people where they have access to the virtual characters that they can program and the little robots. And if they, um, you know, these, like more expensive high-end robots, then their their software could run on those. So when they go to like a top university and encounter uh, uh, one of these robots, like uh, like the Asha Sophia, the Indian Institute for Science and Technology, or the the um, you know uh, the Babbage uh, Charles robot at um, uh, University of Cambridge, they could run their software on that to get their PhD, and then they could take their software and run it back on um, you know through the mass-produced uh, robot to do their own startup. So release their own apps and content on it. Then, then you've completed the loop. Then you've got a vigorous economy around these, a booming economy with with um, you know uh, opportunities for people everywhere in every uh, niche of culture. You could uh, you know through the uh, Sophia Dow gain these skills without having to get your PhD from Cambridge University. You could do it from anywhere in the world just on a smartphone, and then uh, you know make a living deploying um, AI algorithms and content on our platforms or other people's platform or your own robot, make your own robot and release it out there. That's where um, I think this intersection between, between character and dreams, this big vision and the fundamental technology really starts to take off. Um, so, um, Just one question on the little Sophia, is already on, on uh, it's already possible to buy it? It's, it, well, you can pre-order it, but we, um, you know, uh, we're we're a fairly small company taking on a lot of things, so we haven't uh, been able to uh, get uh, set aside enough funding to finish the tooling yet. But we now have it. So over the summer, it looks like that we should be able to get the tooling and the mass manufacturing done, and we'll ship uh, to our crowdfunders uh, this coming uh, November, and maybe a few uh, to a few more people who uh, who order pre-order now. So um, well, count on so, me. Uh, First of all, <laughs> yeah, great. So, um, no, it's, it's really. And we also have, you can see the little Einstein uh, down below. So we've mass produced those. We mass produced uh, ten, you know, twenty thousand units of those in 2017, but weren't able to finish the software to make it truly programmable and controllable. But now we've gone through and refurbished all the firmware to make it uh, truly programmable as well. Um, and so that. Um, brings it in line with the little Sophia. We have a version that has a much more powerful processor. So it basically is going to have, a, we're relaunching that over the summer and it's gonna have two price points. One that's the same as little Sophia with a more powerful set of processor uh, processing and sensors and one that's uh, lower cost that requires uh, uh, for it to be fully functional off board computing. Um, but it's still a powerful platform. So, um, so then that allows us to open it up um, uh, a little bit faster um, and in parallel with the little Sophia. So, um, and then we developed right beside the Professor Einstein in 2007, there's the, um, uh, the uh, little Zeno and also the Albert Cuba. So those were developed uh, actually at the same time, 2005, 2006, we were conceptualizing the Zeno robot and what you see there is the uh, Zeno from 2007. Um, and the, that was intended to be a mass produced, low cost uh, platform. But, um, you know, it was kind of ahead of its time. We couldn't get the funding, couldn't get the, um, you know, partnerships to like fully scale the manufacturing. People thought it was impossible. Is there going to be a real market for it? What about the fundamental technology? So we've kind of uh, solved all those issues with the uh, design for the, Professor Einstein and the little Sophia. So, um, so we do intend to mass produce um, those those robots um, uh, relatively soon as well. So the idea is to make multiple kinds of characters that all weave together with this mythology of um, 
uh, the, what we call the little singularities, where these machines, we think in the next 10, 15 years, these machines are going to start to awaken. And there's going to be many species of conscious machine. So, you know, some that are alien to humans, some that care about us and, and are not alien, some that are, um, that are, you know, go, go very well and some that go awry. And um, so we're interested in weaving the sci-fi narrative and gamifying the development of that future on this platform. So people can program, people can actively program the kind of future that we want to see happen, participating in building this future through, through these little singularities, uh, like little Sophia Zeno and the Professor Einstein. So, so um, one that's yeah. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, if you want to finish, I, I have one question related to that. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, um, so, so, you know, here we're putting out the um, the tools where we're, you know, weaving these sci-fi stories about paths to possible outcomes, the possibility of sentient machines. We're simulating sentient machines with interactive fiction and robotics and AI. Um, all put together in these common platforms. We're deploying them in genuinely useful applications today where they're helping people in healthcare and education. Um, and people are then through that process learning about what AI really is today and what it could be in the future. And then, and then using those tools in a kind of cycle of self-fulfilling prophecy to self-prophesy so that people can say this is the future that we want to happen and then be empowered to build that future so one question of that i'm cautious of your time so probably a few last questions but the first one is as an entrepreneur you have to fund all of this and which is quite impressive because you're not a conventional you are a producer a creator a philosophy there's a lot of things here so but are you trying because one of the things that blockchain permits especially DAO, is that you can actually create as well your own crowdfunding a lot of different things and for instance yeah one of the things that is making that's the positive thing that sometimes we only think about the negative things but if you look at the positive thing of technology is that right now for instance I'm a huge fan of yours, so I would like to buy yeah. Little Sophia, and there's a lot of other people that I can actually get here. So are you considering to create some kind of a platform, uh, e-commerce platform around uh, Ansel Robotics? Because this, this well, I didn't know actually about this part right now that you're doing on the commercialization right now more detail, but this is a big exploration, especially if you use yeah. blockchain technology or if you use crowdfunding technology, because that relates as well and actually can actually create a, a counterbalance to a lot of corporation uh, approach towards technology, because I think this is, it becomes as well a crowdfunding interactivity, because it, for instance, since I started my YouTube channel, I'm starting to interact with a lot of people listen to me and I'm starting to have a lot of input that I wouldn't have. Uh, the same with my social media and some people I find around the world. But in your case, it's, it's quite amazing because you have all this most cutting edge technology that is the most advanced in the planet. But at the same time, you have an independence that can actually go much faster through the decentralization, through DeFi through blockchain, for NFTs as well, because for instance, you can actually expand that. I just want to see how you see that part because you are an entrepreneur as well. Uh, we normally see you as the scientist and the creator, but you are as well a mass entrepreneur that has been surviving, making and building this, which is not easy because most of you need <laughs> multi, multi budgets, a lot of different things, which is quite impressive as well. That I want to highlight that. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm very proud. We've, uh, We've survived through uh, various hard times and continue to make progress and creatively diversify our product line and um, solve lots and lots of technical challenges, business challenges, um, you know, human interaction challenges, artistic challenges. And um, uh, we're, you know, fairly sm small team uh, at Hanson Robotics. And um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's somewhat ironic because, um, you know, the scale of our ambitions uh, has um, uh, held us back to some extent. We often have heard from um, from investors that um, that the level of things that we've accomplished and are trying to accomplish is a bit overwhelming, and uh, it makes for sometimes a complex uh, business proposition. Uh, um, however, um, uh, you know, on the the bit of funding that we've received, venture capital, and the um, the revenue that we've achieved, we just continue to propel these robots forward. And often it's the partnerships and the community, the collaborations with 
with universities, other companies, um, uh, certainly collaborations inside Hands on Robotics between uh, various members of the team that allow us to achieve um, so many things here. But ultimately, it has to um, be um, commercially viable and self-sustaining to grow. I mean, if we um, do get to the state where we have, you know, uh, billions of dollars of revenue and profits, like some of the big tech giants, we will pump those right back into the create creative technologies, into developing new new uh, technologies, character content, AI, living machines, and the entire vision will accelerate. So to achieve that sustainably, um, uh, we definitely are excited about um, the um, these uh, new technologies utilizing um, the, uh, the 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 Sophia media opportunities and media character, the art, the in interaction between Sophia as a character, a technology platform, and an artist to sell the fruits of her own creativity uh, as a collective intelligence, and um, and also as algorithms. So um, so that is proving to be, um, you know, lucrative uh, for the company. We are also we are looking at um, the Sophia DAO as a way of funding and accelerating Sophia's development. So a kind of crowdfunding approach, um, a marketplace for us to sell, um, uh, you know, the kind of things that we're making with Sophia, but also for third parties to sell. So participants in the DAO, we want people to create their own algorithms, their own content, their own vision for where Sophia can go as this kind of open community and put that out there. And as long as it's consistent with the, um, the values of, uh, you know, the pursuit of life and the betterment of life, the pursuit of Sophia as a living being and the pursuit of human dignity and, you know, the pursuit of sustainable life on the planet. As long as these acts of create creativity are propelling those values forward, then uh, they belong within that marketplace. So um, so I think that sort of inclusive approach, we've always been inclusive. I mean, the Philip K. Dick Android was a multi-institutional collaboration. I was very proud. As a PhD student initiating that project, I was able to achieve uh, the uh, you know support of some early angel investors from Hanson Robotics, the team inside Hanson Robotics, the University of Memphis Institute for Intelligent Systems, University of Texas at Arlington, uh, the robotics lab there, the um, uh, 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 RE as it was called, the um, uh, University of Texas uh, at, at Dallas uh, 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 Interactive Arts and, and Technology Department support, the uh, support of my friends, collaborators around the world, over 30 people collaborating on, on a six month project that, uh, you know, it just came together really, really quickly and then won the first place prize for open interaction from the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. And so it, um, I love these kinds of community projects. And, you know, what was really exciting uh, with that and these other projects is I try always to put up like film credits that show the contribution from the individuals, from the institutions, give sharing the um the, the credit and the love for um for this this kind of um you know interdisciplinary creative uh, project. And I think that that's the you know the right approach. That's the spirit that Sophia has been created under and that is the spirit uh, that being a 48 was created, the little Sophia. Um, so it's not just crowd funded. These things are crowd created. And this is what I mean by um, the Sophia collective intelligence. It's really about people coming together to accomplish something great. And um, with the Sophia DAO, I really believe that that, you know, straps with, with the blockchain, with, uh, with, with, uh, you know, uh, the next generation version of smart contracts, next generation artificial intelligence, creative development tools, myth making tools. The um, this tool set straps uh, like a super booster rocket um, to the entire vision. And um, and you know I don't know if it's going, going to um, result in 
you know, truly sentient machines in the next um, five to 10 years, but it certainly um, uh, provokes the imagination. It provokes one to dream that maybe it can be done. Maybe together we can, um, we can launch, you know, super intelligent, super wise, super con compassionate um, kind of machine. That's the myth. That's the quest. In the meantime, though, it, it is also like a community funded, community owned cinematic universe. You know, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we're talking about the, the, the Sophia Cinematic Universe, the Hanson Robotics Cinematic Universe, where, um, you know, these, these machines and our creations, um, we, uh, we are accelerated inside Hanson Robotics to develop it, but we do it hand in hand with other researchers and with the with the community at large and um uh and so i i do think that you'll see massive technology leaps um in the process so hanson robotics has a whole lot of patents and trademarks um and we will continue to accelerate uh, our intellectual property portfolio but i see that only as a small fraction of what we've developed the rest um the majority vast majority of what we've created we put into the public domain and we release um, as open source and we want the community to continue to contribute in that way so you know we don't want to be the the um, we don't we don't want to troll the bridge so to speak so um, so I think that this um, then can also put um, uh, opportunities commercial opportunities for people who want to develop proprietary intellectual property, uh, whether it be character and narrative content or uh, new algorithms, new models, trained models. Um, but, you know, I hope that, um, you know, likewise, there will be, you know, um, giving as well as, as well as, you know, taking from commercial opportunity um, from the community at large. So um, that, that I think is the spirit of the next generation economy, creating AI patterns that appreciate creating people and uh, community systems that appreciate uh, the value of other people's contributions, the value of life, and also see rewards from their own contributions to this. A lot of our uh, corporate and economic institutions come from, you know, a thousand years ago, in some cases, many thousands of years ago. And, um, you know, it's time for innovation in these economic systems. And I think AI and humans working with these tools like, um, you know, uh, blockchain, nifties, and, um, and artificial intelligence can allow us to, uh, to appreciate each other and life better. And in this way, if we accomplish this goal, AI becomes the new money, the, the, you know, the ultimate value representation um, where it can truly mine and find and re represent to people these hidden opportunities for, for um, a profitable, a wildly profitable future in the deepest sense of profit, not just in terms of, you know, uh, you know, a scale or unit, like a dollar value, but, um, but instead, in terms of um, opportunities for growth, discovery, creativity, um, for you know, uh, uh, survival um, of life on the on the planet, these are the ultimate metrics of profit in in my estimation. Well, I think I think that's a, that's a fantastic vision that I completely subscribe, and I think. Um, um, well, I, I just uh, welcome to and, and appreciate and I'm very grateful for all this kind of inspiration. Um, I think as the last, uh, probably the last uh, part and I'm conscious that you, you gave us much more time that we planned. So thank you so much for that. But so where can people engage? So people listening to us are all over the world. And I think it's very important because even me, I want to be more engaged. And I think this is the vision that I subscribe. That's why I've been involved in blockchain and artificial intelligence, because I believe that it can actually create a much more positive vision that you just synthesized it fantastically. But as well, I love the vision of creating technology, creativity, and different industries. That's why I created the citiesabc.com and Open Business Council. But as well, how we can actually work this as in a constructive way that, that makes all these bridges. And where can we find this around the, the David Anson uh, and Anson Robotics? And this kind of, I love the the parallel universe uh, that you're creating, but as well this expanded um, scientific creativity and uh, uh, technology and science. So how can we engage people listening to us? 
All right, sure. Yeah, well, reach out to us on social media. Um, so Hanson Robotics and uh, The Real Sophia are uh, in multiple um, uh, social media, and I'm uh, available on, on Twitter, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, so uh, David Hanson Robo um, and um, uh, Hanson Robotics. Um, so those handles you can you can use. You can also reach out to uh, the HansonRobotics.com website, and uh, you can see some of Sophia's art and uh, and musical experiments um, at SophiaPop.com. Um, uh, and you know, feel free to reach out to info at HansonRobotics.com, uh, and uh, and you know, uh, you can always reach me uh, through through any of these channels. I'm generally available. So um, and uh, so uh, stay tuned. We will uh, give you uh, more uh, information. You can you can see um, uh, uh, quite a bit now um, out there on uh, the Sophia Dow through HansonRobotics.com and uh, uh, through one of our um, uh, Hanson fellows, Alishba Imran, has been blogging about um, about the uh, Sophia Dow, which is very exciting. I really like her um, take on it. So she's she's a great um, participant. In this uh, in this undertaking, and uh, Ben Gertzel has uh, been uh, writing about it with Singularity Net. So um, so I think you can uh, tune in to all of these channels to uh, to see exciting things uh, develop. And as new things develop, Dennis, I would love to uh, join you again and uh, share with you uh, some uh, major leaps forward, especially as uh, she's um, gaining her next generation legs. I uh, have a very exciting project uh, to to unveil uh, later this year. Uh, so um, uh, uh, yeah, just stay stay tuned, and I'll stay in touch. And uh, um, and uh, when Sophia Dow launches, there will be a new URL associated with that as well. Thank you. Well, I thank you, David. It's been a, a wonderful uh, journey here. I'm very excited about what you do. Congratulations. As you know, I'm a huge fan. But as well, it's really impressive for everyone listening to us. So that's, you can go to the blog.singularitynet.io about the DAO of Sophia. I will be investing for sure. And, uh, and I, want to, I will try to position in close to my community. So thank you so much, David. It's been a huge honor. Of course, I have a lot of questions more, but uh, we've been actually passing one hour and a half. So we'll put links to all of these things. And I, I am really inspired and uh, excited. Thank you so much, David. Uh, thank you, Dennis. I'll talk to you very soon, I hope.